Welcome to another edition of Inside the War Room. Ryan Ray here as always, and today my guest is the Washington correspondent for the Sin Sinclair Broadcast Group and the New York Times bestselling author, um, which is part of the reason I reached out. Um, it's great to have you on, Mr. James Rosen. Ryan, thank you. Okay, so let's get right into it. Um, I want to talk about a handful of things, and the list has kind of grown, but um, the main thing was is you've got two books on two different controversial times in America, uh, Dick Cheney and Watergate. So first off, uh, do you like covering controversial things or is there a genesis behind those two subjects? If you are a working reporter and you don't enjoy covering controversial things, you will soon be unemployed. <laughs> uh, that's what reporters do for a living. Uh, so I've been a Washington reporter now since February of 1999. I came to work at Fox News in their Washington bureau in February 22, 1999, which I believe was the first business day after the acquittal of President Clinton at his impeachment trial. So I missed all of that craziness. Uh, but it's been a wild ride since. I was there for 19 years. I've been with the Sinclair Broadcast Group for three years um, and covering all the same things, politics and elections, national security, uh, foreign policy, uh, scandals, um, and everything Washington has to offer. So the, answer, the short answer to your question is yes. Uh, and yes, those are two books about two very different times. So Watergate obviously predates me. Um, it's, I don't find it fascinating. There's some things in history that I find fascinating. I can't get into the Watergate story. Um, it, 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 what am I missing? Why is that still in the public arena today? I've heard some older folks talk about it, but to me, it just, it just, I can't get sucked into that one. So Watergate was a very complex set of events, um, and it went on for years with multiple actors, most of them lawyers, in a ro rotating cast of meetings and telephone calls, sometimes involving the President of the United States. And of course, the break-in that started it all off. Um, it is still relevant because the Nixon presidency, I like to say, was the template for the modern. Everything we've seen play out ever since, really, from Iran-Contra to the Mueller investigation, uh, really just... Um, in some ways echoes Watergate. I would say when we turned the page from the po uh, into from the post Watergate era, right, which is after President Nixon resigns, Gerald Ford is president. I mean, again, in Gerald Ford, you have the only man in American history who became president of the United States without ever having been elected president or even vice president. It's an extraordinary thing. He went from being a congressman in Michigan to president of the United States in about a year and a half. But in any case, um, when we really turned the page was 9-11. That was something altogether new. Uh, the idea that the U.S. homeland would be vulnerable to a mass casualty attack by a non-state actor. Um, and, um, but even so, once 9-11 uh, happened and Washington recovered from the shock, uh, we started to see a 9-11 commission and uh, one of the chief figures on that commission had been a Watergate special prosecutor, and he interrogated Condoleezza Rice famously. Uh, so even that carried echoes of Watergate. So it just, the Nixon presidency was when media started to flex their muscle, when uh, you could get a, a handsome looking paperback edition turned out in about a week featuring the president's tapes. Mm. Oh, and it seemed so official. And when for the first time we started having saturation coverage, and when the media, like Dan Rather at the time and others, started giving the president a really hard time, whereas all the way up through Lyndon Johnson, the media had been complicit with various presidents in covering up various things. Uh, the gloves were off for Richard Nixon. Uh, the fact that he taped all of his conversations foreshadows the kind of uh, omnipresent mass media we have today. Mm. Uh, every, every, you know, Richard Nixon was the last politician, Ryan, or the last public figure of any kind in America, the last celebrity who could be forgiven for imagining that all of his stuff won't come out. But once the Supreme Court ruled eight to nothing that President Nixon had to turn over his tapes to the Watergate special prosecutors, um, every public figure in all walks of life has been on notice that your stuff not only will come out, but it will be used against you and you will be vilified coast to coast on the basis of it. So that when we would see in latter times, um, uh, an Anthony Weiner, let's say, sexting young women or what have you, you know, he had been on notice uh, from Richard Nixon on, your stuff comes out. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a trans transformative event, Watergate. Um, I'd urge you to take another crack at it. And I think the book you ought to read is The Strong Man, John Mitchell and the Secrets of Watergate <laughs> by James Rosen. 
<laughs> Absolutely. I will yeah, take another look at it. It's four dollars on eBay at this point. <laughs> well, that's part of the reason I want to have you on. Um, so I, I've heard some of that framing, which I find fascinating, which is the media kind of changed their perspective of the POTUS post Watergate. Um, how do we view history? in the media pre-Watergate, if the, all the media admits that, hey, we're really become critical after Watergate, it's like, well, how then do we view what was reported about, you know, Kennedy or Eisenhower or whomever before? Well, in the in the wake of Watergate and all of its subsidiary scandals, um, uh, there were extraordinary revelations about presidents dating back to FDR mm. and their use of so-called black bag jobs by the FBI to break into uh, offices and homes, uh, not only of criminal suspects, but of polit political opponents, newspapermen, and so forth. Uh, with President Kennedy, there were revelations of an altogether different nature. Um, and these have caused us to reevaluate these presidents in some respects. But even Richard Nixon has undergone a, a, an enormous reevaluation, and I think that continues. Um, now, you ask about history and how we're to evaluate it. I want to add one more caution and perhaps an enticement to reading the Strong Man, John Mitchell and the Secrets of Watergate by James Rosen. Um, I, in, in, in terms of Watergate history, I am what you would call an avowed revisionist. Now, revisionist history in general gets a, has a terrible reputation and mostly uh, deservedly so for exercises like Holocaust revisionism, which are contemptible. Uh, but as Oscar Wilde said, in most cases anyway, not for something like the Holocaust, but um, our lone duty to history is continually to rewrite it. And uh, a lot of scholarship, a lot of evidence has come out since Richard Nixon waved on uh, before he boarded that helicopter. A lot of tapes have come out, a lot of new evidence, a lot of new testimony. And if you've been paying attention to it all along, as I and a few other dogged scholars have been, uh, you would have to become, you would have to come as I did, I think, to a revisionist history of Watergate that re-examines A, what was the true purpose uh, of the actual break-in and wiretapping operation at Democratic National Committee headquarters? Um, who, who gave the final authority for it? What was the role of the Central Intelligence Agency in it? Who was the real prime driver of the Watergate cover-up that went to, wound up with so many people going to prison, including the former Attorney General of the United States, John Mitchell, the subject of my book, and other associated questions? And I came to very different answers than the so-called conventional narrative of Watergate, the Woodward Bernstein version of Watergate. Um, a lot of scholarship's been done just on Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein in recent years, showing how they misled their readers repeatedly throughout the book and the film, All the President's Men. So um, uh, when you talk about how are we to evaluate history, I would um, urge that in the case of Watergate particularly, the Nixon presidency particularly, there is a conventional narrative of history and there's a revisionist narrative of history, which I think uh, commands at least equal attention. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you you talk about the revisionist history because um, there, there's also the the reality that the further we go, the better we understand the implications of an action too, right? And so um, we would like you know, to believe that you, we would like to believe that that is a, that is akin to believing that as uh, time unfolds, our scientific and technological progress um, proceeds in a straight uh, upward diagonal line. Um, the fact is, too, that the passage of time sometimes has the ability to cement um, narratives into place um, and to um, discourage um, original thinking about characters and events in history. It depends on. So let's talk about the other character that I want to talk to you about with Dick Cheney. Um, and it's kind of great timing here with Afghanistan. Um, what's, what's happening over there and kind of his role with the Bush administration um, Dick Cheney seems to be uh, of the living politicians, maybe the one of the most hated at current date. Like there's a lot of animosity towards him um, because, you know, you have Trump, which you could say that half the nation hates, half the nation loves. But the Bush, the Bush uh, Cheney group, like they're generally kind of just not looked upon highly by both crowds, it seems right now. Um, I'm not sure that I would I would consider a, a depiction of President Trump's reception throughout the country uh, as being evenly divided between those who love him and those who hate him as being entirely accurate. But putting that aside, uh, you, how, how would you how would you phrase it about President Trump? I would say there's um, there's a you know, he always had a floor um, of absolute bedrock support. Mm. Um, uh, he obviously, you know, he he expanded the number of people who voted for him in his reelection campaign, but he did not win the popular vote either time. Mm. Um, 
you know, I think even amongst his supporters, were the, there were those who didn't love him, as you put it, but who liked the policy outcomes. Um, but you asked about Dick Cheney. Sure. Sure. And uh, the name of that book is Cheney One on One, uh, a candid conversation with America's most controversial statesman. It came out in 2015. The whole book is a set of transcripts of 10 hours of oral history that I conducted with the former vice president in his home across three days in 2014. We were supposed to do two hours a day for three consecutive days for six hours. Uh, we wound up going 10 hours. And as everyone knows, lovers or haters of Dick Cheney, he's not one to waste words much. So the fact that he spent an extra four hours with me, I think, is a sign that he considered the exercise a, a valuable one. Uh, we covered his entire career, his entire life. Um, but we spent a lot of time on 9-11, both the, the pre-9-11 period, the mm -hmm. day of the attacks, uh, the post-9-11 response, then the Iraq war. Again, the planning for the invasion, the execution, uh, what went wrong thereafter. Uh, and so for anyone who's interested in, in the early 21st century, um, it's, I think, a, an excellent primary source. Um, when I finished the three days of interviews, um, I didn't know it at the moment because it wasn't yet transcribed, but I had in my possession about 80,000 words of our conversations. Um, I took about 9,000 words from different portions of the three days, and I published that, you'll be interested to know, as the Playboy interview with Dick Cheney uh, in the April 2015 issue. And um, Playboy, at that time anyway, uh, it was about the fifth, four, fifth, fourth or fifth time that I had written for them, used to have a division that would tabulate uh, or keep a tally of when their content was getting picked up by external media of any kind. And in the case of the Playboy interview with Dick Cheney, they found uh, that it was quite improbably the most popular feature by that metric in the history of the magazine because the Playboy interview with Dick Cheney was mentioned 650 million times in all media, earthly and terrestrial. Why? Because in those excerpts, uh, the former vice president said something fairly controversial to me. He said that Barack, this was, the interviews were late 2014. Uh, the interview was published first half 2015, the book, the final half of 2015. So Barack Obama was president. Mr. Cheney said that Barack Obama is the worst president of my lifetime. And it was shortly after the Ferguson unrest and the former vice president said that he believed that uh, Obama and uh, Mr. Obama and Eric Holder, the attorney general at the time, were guilty of playing the race card. These were controversial statements, and they got picked up everywhere. I was uh, privileged to attend the White House Correspondents Association dinner that year where President Obama appeared, and as customarily for the chief executive, did a small, short sort of stand-up comedy routine. And the president said, I see where uh, Dick Cheney calls me uh, the worst president of his lifetime. And the crowd sort of laughed in recognition of the headline. And he said, well, that's interesting to me. Because uh, I considered Dick Cheney the worst president of my lifetime, which was, <laughs> I remember uh, that line. I remember uh, that. Now, the heart of the joke, and of course, we always kill comedy when we explain it, but the heart of the joke was a reference to the idea that George W. Bush was kind of a figurehead and Dick Cheney mm -hmm. was real malevolent power behind mm -hmm. the throne. Mm -hmm. Certainly, Dick Cheney was the most influential vice president in modern history. And when we talk about 9-11, and of course, we will be talking about 9-11 as the 20th anniversary approaches just a couple of weeks from now, um, everybody, Ryan, has their memories of 9-11 if you were of a certain age at the time. You, you remember where you were when you heard about it, um, uh, what you were doing, and so on, as for previous generation was the case with the Kennedy assassination and news of that. There's only one American whose memory of 9-11 is, I had to run the federal government at the time because the president was hopscotching around the country in Air Force One, coming back from Florida. And that person is Dick Cheney. And he did it from a bunker beneath the White House called the Presidential Emergency Operations Center, or PIOC, which was a World War II construction, terribly outdated for the communications needs of 2001. Uh, but it was Cheney who, uh, it was Mr. Cheney who was essentially uh, guiding the federal response in the, in the early chaotic hours uh, when the towers came down, the Pentagon was struck, and the plane went down in Pennsylvania. Uh, from working with the transportation secretary to ground all the flights above the skies, above, above the, the, uh, the American homeland. Uh, working with the Defense Department on orders about whether to shoot down if there was another plane incoming for the White House or the Capitol building, as was believed at the time, um, and so on. Um, and Cheney told me in those interviews 
if, if you if you look at the photographs that were eventually released years later by the National Archives of that bunker at that time, you can see uh, the National Security Advisor, Condoleezza Rice. You can see the president's longtime confidant from Texas, Karen Hughes. These were people who, who knew George W. Bush a lot better than Dick Cheney did at that point, really. Um, but if you look at the body language and the composition of those photographs, you'll see that Vice President Cheney is the center of gravity in that room. He is, to use a patriarchal, outdated term, the big daddy in that room. And everyone you can see recognizes it in their own body language. He was calling the shots. Um, and um, he told me in our interviews that in those moments, um, what came flooding back to him was a course that he had taken when he was a congressman um, from Wyoming, the same seat his daughter now occupies, um, back in the 1980s. Uh, way back uh, in the days, for example, when Dick Cheney was a leadership figure in the Republican House and when he was, um, in fact, the top Republican on the Iran-Contra Committee, he took a course in what's called continuity of government, which is, uh, and he and other members of Congress and others were brought out to a, rich, a remote environment and given lessons on how you keep the United States federal government functioning in the event, as was pondered in those days, of a nuclear attack from the Soviet Union. And that's how he um, approached his urgent, singular business on the day of 9-11. That's covered in the book. To, to address the, finally the actual question you posed about um, the standing of the Cheneys um, in, in modern politics, um, it's true that the Republican Party has changed a lot since Dick Cheney's time, whether we go back all the way to the 1980s, as we were just discussing, or even to the, the early 2000s. Uh, when George W. Bush uh, became the only Republican to win the popular vote in, what, the last 25 years or so, um, in part by capturing a, a record high a percentage of the Latino vote uh, in 2004, as the Bush-Cheney ticket did. Um, but um, Dick Cheney has been fairly quiet through all of this. He's now 80. I think one reason he's been quiet is because he secured from President Trump something that was very important to him. And I think he's had the good grace to, um, to stay quiet for that reason, which is uh, that Mr. Trump uh, issued a full pardon for Mr. Cheney's former chief of staff at the White House, Scooter Libby, whereas George W. Bush had only been willing to uh, commute the sentence of Mr. Libby. And you see how loyal Cheney, Mr. Cheney was to Scooter Libby, that he persisted all the way through the Trump administration to finally get that full pardon. Um, where Liz Cheney is concerned, obviously, she's a controversial figure right now. Um, uh, she was essentially expelled from GOP leadership because uh, she condemns former President Trump. And we might see this as a, as a measurement of the, the grip that the former president still exercises over the Republican electorate. Or in political science terms, Ryan, we might measure it, uh, we might see it in a more measured term, which is simply that it reflects the grip that the former president enjoys over the Republican leadership and the Republican conference. Um, but I, I would venture so far as to say that while we may have heard the last of Dick Cheney, he may be officially retired and not speaking out too much anymore, I don't think we've heard the last of Liz Cheney. One of the problems that the Cheney Bush Bush Cheney ticket has is that they their foreign policy had a lot of lasting impacts. You know, it's where we went to Afghanistan, went to Iraq, we had the Patriot Act, um, and as that's gone on, um, I don't necessarily fault Biden for what's happening in Afghanistan today. I think that that was going to happen regardless who's in office. Um, there's probably some tweaks to be made, but when we look back, there's more and more Americans that seem they're frustrated with what. The Bush and Cheney ticket did, um, and so that seems to be kind of part of the legacy that they're, they're they're trying to fight against, right? Is you know you got us in all these wars, you expand the government, you did this stuff, um, and it's not viewed with favor. So, do you think that Cheney himself would uh, is, is proud of what they did? Does he agree with those decisions? Would he have to tweak some of that stuff? What would you read there? Well, you don't have to take my word for it. If you read the book, Cheney One on One, we went into great detail about all of those decisions, um, uh, the action against Afghanistan and the Taliban at that time, uh, the invasion of Iraq, the follow through. Um, and he did stand by all of those decisions. Um, and um, 
that we would see a chaotic scene in 2021 at the Kabul International Airport uh, and the and the swift advance of the Taliban and the collapse of the Afghan government in 2021, I don't think is necessarily attributable to the Bush-Cheney decision making. Um, President Obama acknowledged in one of his news conferences that AQI, Al Qaeda in Iraq, which was the predecessor group to ISIS, um, had all but been defeated um, by around 2009, 2010. The surge strategy that Bush Cheney implemented in 2010 actually worked. And by the time uh, the Bush Cheney administration left office, Iraq was pretty stable, especially by comparison to latter day times. And um, they would argue that the actions that President Obama took um, um, unwound a lot of the good work that they did. That'll be for historians and military analysts to argue about for decades to come. Um, it is true that the Republican Party is more, for lack of a better word, isolationist than it used to be in the Bush-Cheney era and for many decades before that. If you go back to Eisenhower and Nixon and Reagan, the, the era of Goldwater and Bill Buckley, um, uh, the very f forefathers of the modern conservative movement in America today, there was always support for a muscular interventionist foreign policy abroad. Um, Perhaps it is the policies of the Bush-Cheney era that, that turned the Republican Party away from that kind of policy. Um, perhaps it's the changing nature of warfare itself. Um, it remains an open question, I think, and for brighter minds than my own to assess, whether the United States has yet shown that it can win an asymmetric war. Okay. Uh, and is asymmetric war uh, the, the prevailing means of conflict in the 21st century. Um, and, and, and what defines asymmetric war aside from its asymmetry? It is, does it have to involve any kinetic action whatsoever? Um, one can argue that, uh, Russian and Chinese, um, information operations or disinformation operations, uh, in this country in recent elections, um, has served a, an extraordinarily destabilizing purpose couldn't potentially be achieved with, um, or achieved cleanly with, with military action. So um, it's a complicated picture. Um, I think as time goes by, I think George W. Bush's standing will rise in presidential rankings because uh, he conducted himself like a president of the United States. I think one experience for Donald Trump is that while he may have been an appealing protest vote in 2016, um, and, and a way for the electorate to signal its absolute rejection of the political classes from which group uh, we had always hired for the presidency, except for the generals. Um, I think his experience shows that Americans nonetheless like their presidents to be presidential. Um, and I think, honestly, it was, it was Donald Trump's election to lose. And even with the pandemic, and had he just comported himself a little differently throughout 2020 and at key moments uh, in the coronavirus briefings, in the debate with Mr. Biden, he might have seen a different outcome. Yeah, we had on uh, Ryan Gradowski last episode, and we touched that a little bit, which is um, uh, I am I, I didn't vote for either major, major candidate. But, you know, knowing Trump supporters um, who um, you know here in Texas, there was plenty of them who were like, oh, man. He would just tone it down a little bit. <laughs> they couldn't get as enthused as they were in 2016. So I think that did take a toll um, on the electorate, uh, probably more than Trump voters want to um, acknowledge. But okay, we got about 10 minutes here left. So I want to talk about the media because you were tied up with the Obama administration. They were potentially spying on you or following you, or what's kind of the story there? Because one of the big frustrations I had during the Trump era and Biden ran this well as well is. Obama had the, quote, scandal-free administration. And to me, you talk about the failures of the media at large. There's plenty of them, but it's that kind of nonsense being purported <laughs> that's, that just, it blows my mind because there were plenty of scandals and you were uh, not by your own fault, but kind of wrapped up in one. They were following you or targeted you for some reporting you did. What, what's the story there? I was two scandals, Ryan. Two scandals. Uh, okay. Sorry. I didn't want to shortchange you. <laughs> two at that time. Um, the short version of this is that um, in 2013, it was disclosed 
that um, the FBI had submitted a signed and secret search warrant application to a federal judge four years earlier, in which uh, the FBI described me, then a reporter for Fox News, as a criminal co-conspirator in a violation of the Espionage Act in connection with reporting I had done um, uh, regarding North Korea. And uh, as part of a national security leak investigation into that reporting, the Obama administration, the FBI, swiftly identified someone whom they believed to be my source for that information. Um, and in order to uh, have the legal right to rummage through my uh, telephone records uh, associated with my cell phone, my office phone, the White House booth that Fox News had, the State Department booth, the Pentagon booth, and even my parents' home phone line, uh, the administration, the FBI, uh, sought this uh, submitted this uh, search warrant application secretly to a federal judge alleging me I, to be a I, criminal. I, warning. I was subpoenaed, right? I'm sorry? I, FISA court is what they did, right? No, that was not FISA. That oh, is for, FISA. Okay. FISA is for actual surveillance, like a, a wiretap okay. or surveilling somebody. The, the surveillance placed on me was of a different nature, but they submitted it to a federal judge who approved it. So on that basis, the FBI then had access to rummage around through my private Gmail account, through all those phone lines, including the phone lines of my parents, their records. Um, and uh, when this was disclosed, it caused a great controversy. And briefly, I outtrended my fellow celebrities, Taylor Swift and Justin Bieber on Twitter, um, <laughs> because uh, this was new in American history. Never before had any working reporter been designated by any administration as a criminal co-conspirator in a violation of the Espionage Act simply for doing his job. In fact, Neil Sheehan, who was the New York Times reporter who in 1971 published the Pentagon Papers, which was a set of 7,000 classified documents tracing American involvement in Vietnam through the years, not even the Nixon administration designated Neil Sheehan a criminal co-conspirator and sought to prosecute him. And when all of this became public, the administration then said, well, we never meant to prosecute James Rosen. Well, then you had no business submitting that search warrant. Um, and uh, President Obama gave a speech at the time saying that it was wrong to criminalize reporters for uh, doing their jobs and that he would appoint someone to find out, to get to the bottom of how this happened. The person he appointed was the Attorney General, Eric Holder, who had already acknowledged that he himself had signed off on this search warrant. <laughs> so that's what passed for accountability. Um, it, 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 it also transpired that five days before all of this became known, Attorney General Holder had been testifying before the House Judiciary Committee, and he was asked point blank about the potential prosecution of a member of the news media for the unauthorized disclosure of classified information. And the Attorney General testified, and I'm paraphrasing, but fairly closely, in terms of the potential prosecution of a member of the news media for the unauthorized disclosure of classified information, that's not something I've ever heard of been involved in or would regard as wise policy. And it turned out, of course, that in fact he had signed off on just such a search warrant and just such a potential prosecution. There's a plain word for when that happens. Um, be that as it may, um, the House Judiciary Committee, their majority staff, the Republicans, issued a report uh, designating the Attorney General's testimony on that occasion as false and misleading. Um, the rules were changed. And um, uh, ultimately, the individual who was identified as my source pleaded guilty in open court and spent uh, some time in prison associated with this. Uh, it was disclosed that the Obama administration uh, in, um, launched more such prosecutions than all of the presidents that preceded the Obama administration combined. Um, and so uh, there were not just, you wouldn't have to go to the far precincts of Fox News' primetime lineup to find the sentiment expressed. It was expressed by former yeah. executive editor of the Washington Post and the New York Times and CBS News that the Obama administration was the most controlling and, and secretive of any in their lifetime, and that this represented a real assault on the freedom of the press. Which is why. That was one thing. That oh, was one. Okay. Go if we have time, go ahead. very yeah. briefly. Um, it was also subsequently discovered that the Obama administration, the State Department, 
on the video on the website page where they they archive all of the videos of prior State Department briefings. Mm -hmm. It is an official website uh, populated by official federal documents. Um, every time the, the State Department uploads to its website the video of the previous days or that day's State Department press briefing, that camera was operated by a federal technician. Uh, the camera and the equipment and so forth were federally appropriated. Those are federal records. And it is a crime to tamper with federal records. Well, it was discovered in uh, around 2016, I think, that um, that uh, an eight-minute section of uh, a State Department press briefing from, I believe, 2013, in, where I was a, uh, the, the reporter doing the questioning and Jen Psaki was the State Department spokesperson at the time. An eight-minute segment of our exchanges from, from one of those briefings had been purposefully deleted from the video that was uploaded to the official State Department website archive uh, and replaced with a simple white flash so that Jen Psaki's head appeared to move strangely on one or the other side of that white flash. And during those eight minutes, uh, I had pursued the following line of questioning. I had gotten a tip way back in early 2013 that the U.S. was engaged in some kind of secret bilateral talks with Iran, with whom we don't maintain any diplomatic relations. And so I marched into the State Department briefing room at the time, and I asked the briefer at that time, this was February of 2013, Victoria Newland, who occupies a high position in the Biden administration today. I, I asked, in essence, is it true that the United States is presently engage in some kind of secret bilateral talks with the Iranians? No, came the answer. You know, of the kind of talks you're talking about, no. Well, uh, within about eight to 11 months, the exact time frame is hazy for me at this point, but the Obama administration splashly announced that they had reached the framework for an Iran nuclear deal that had begun in these secret talks with Iran, facilitated by the Middle East nation of Oman, uh, approximately 11 months earlier. So I marched into the State Department briefing room and Jen Psaki was the briefer. And over the course of the next eight minutes, I began by saying, I would like to read to you the transcript from my exchange with Victoria Newland from February 6, 2013. Question, is the United States presently engaged in some kind of secret bilateral talks with Iran? Answer, no. I said, was that a lie? And Jen Psaki did what she does well and um, offered a, a response that was that sounded perhaps substantive to the untrained ear, but which was in fact non-responsive. And we went back and forth for eight minutes. And finally, I, I said, Jen, let me, let me try this one, one more way. Is it the policy of this government that it is permissible to lie to the news media in order to preserve the secrecy of secret negotiations? And she said, well, James, I think you understand there are times when diplomacy requires privacy, and this was one of those times. And that very day, uh, not only Fox News, but CBS News, Politico, a lot of people picked up on it. It seemed like an acknowledgement from Jen Psaki at the State Department podium that her predecessor at that very podium, Victoria Newland, had lied to the media in order to protect the secrecy of those secret negotiations. About a year or so went by, and then another Obama aide, Ben Rhodes, made some ill-advised comments to a reporter from the New York Times Magazine about how they quote unquote sold the Iranian nuclear deal through the building of an echo chamber involving think tanks and so forth. Um, and I was assigned to cover that story for Fox News. So I said to my producer, go back and get those two briefings, the one with Victoria Newland and the one with Jen Psaki. That caused a, a, a controversy at the time. And he came back and he said, you won't believe it. In the second briefing from the State Department website, that whole exchange is gone, all eight minutes. It's replaced by a white flash. There were two investigations conducted at the Department of State, including one by the legal advisor, the so-called general counsel of the State Department. Um, the uh, lady in her 60s, I think, who was the State Department faceless bureaucrat who uploads the briefings to the website, uh, apparently testified in those proceedings that she received a call from a woman who was her superior who mentioned James Rosen and Iran and Fox News and instructed that that white flash be inserted. But this lady could, for the life of her, not recall who that woman was. Mm -hmm. um, the State Department effectively apologized to a certain degree that the White House and the FBI never did. Uh, John Kirby, who was the, the admiral, who was the State Department spokesman at the time, now the Pentagon press secretary, uh, once again, or the Pentagon 
spokesman uh, spoke out at the time, said James Rosen is a respected reporter, this shouldn't have happened, and so on. So uh, they spied on me, they censored me. There isn't there aren't that many boxes left to check of oppressive state action against a reporter. I'm, I should consider myself fortunate that I'm still here to have this podcast with you. Democracy dies in darkness. There's some media out there <laughs> that talks about that. Okay. So in full disclosure, since you're on the record here, um, we are going to have to edit part of this podcast because we had a little technical difficulty. That is not me editing you out. Just <laughs> so I agree. clarification. <laughs> yeah. So that's not, I'm not pulling a Jen Psaki on you. <laughs> so, well, so- I, I- it was really established that Jen Psaki was the character. Who uh, right, that. yeah. I don't, I don't know who he is. I'm using her name. No, I appreciate that you brought it up because perhaps my previous remarks might have left that impression. I don't think Jen Psaki was yeah, responsible. No, no I, know, I know. I know that when she became the uh, White House press secretary, people kind of were alluding that she might have been. Whoever did it, it's, uh, this is a mutually agreed edit on this podcast, just for those listening. Yes. I, if you listen to I don't edit them, but this is something that we've had technical difficulty and we had to work around. Okay. Uh, I know you're up against the clock. You had to go. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Folks can get your books on Amazon. We'll link to that. Follow you on Twitter at James Rosen TV. Um, is there anywhere else you want them to go follow your work at? Well, for the moment at the Sinclair Broadcast Group station near you. Okay. And any new book projects coming down the pipe you can, talk, you can tell us about? I do have another book I'm working on. I will come back and discuss it with you when okay. it is for sale. That's out. Okay. Okay, perfect. And in the meantime, I will go read the Watergate book. That's my promise to you. Listeners, thank you so much. And until uh, we'll talk to you, uh, let's see, this come out on Thursday. So we'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it.